tomatoes. They could be Ghana's red gold. The soil is ideal, and they've been cultivated in the country for decades. Yet Ghana's tomato factories now stand empty, and farmers are opting to leave the country. The reason is that tomatoes have become gambling chips in global trade policy, as have other products. Africa is a lucrative market. Shipments of canned tomatoes, milk powder and frozen chicken from industrialized nations promise huge profits. Global trade policies are destroying domestic markets and forcing people to leave their countries. Edward, for one, no longer harvests tomatoes in Ghana, but in Italy, under appalling conditions. Ghana built up its tomato industry after gaining independence in 1957. The country was keen to develop its economy and utilize its own natural resources. Today, all of Ghana's tomato processing plants have shut down, including this one in Pualugu. There are many reasons, an unstable power grid, unsuitable tomato varieties, and global trade policy. Italy, China, and other countries are dumping canned and processed tomatoes on Ghana. It still look fresh. That's why when I come, I'm, I'm security, I, I sweep. When I'm not tight, I go to fetch water and come. For, uh, nobody asks me, but I feel it's a bit good for me and for everybody. So I have to do it. This, uh, we are the factory. So uh, the shows that the factory is still alive. It's not completely dead. Last year, the tomatoes, good to a case. Before God and man, if you see the way the tomatoes was wrapped, lying down there, no market. And this factory too was not working. So I was just crying. Vincent Atinga now grows onions instead of tomatoes. He also used to work at the factory. He and other former workers still come here. They can't bear the thought of giving it up. This factory once provided a livelihood to an entire region. I know the secret of the factory. I know the importance of the factory. Because if this factory is working, a lot of people are getting jobs. So as it has closed, it's very sad. So, yeah. And everything is working. There's no any fear that these machines are not working. I'm here all the time. It gives us headache that you have something that could have touched lives, is, is there sitting with you and not working. It's something that is so frustrating. If this factory is workable again, it is going to be the light of the north. The personnel officers. We still hang take care of the police, but we think one day, one day. Uh, well, uh, hello, I want to speak to the Minister of Treat. Yeah, uh, please, uh, this call is coming from uh, Northern Star Toronto's factory, Palugu. If you could do something like the Italian tomatoes, the Chinese tomatoes that they import into the country, because we have good quality tomatoes in Ghana. If you can support us a lot, we can also do much so that the factory will sustain. Yes, sir. Okay, I hear you. Thank you, sir. Even if the Minister of Trade were on the line, he wouldn't be able to simply call a halt to tomato imports. Trade policies are a global competition, and the more powerful players stand a better chance at accessing the most lucrative markets. 
it's the people on the ground who lose out. Benedicta Afrifa is a tomato farmer in Torbodom, in the middle of one of Ghana's main tomato production regions. The many day laborers looking to be hired during the harvest season attest to widespread unemployment. Even at the busiest time of year, some won't find work. Nearly half of Ghana's population lives from agriculture. A robust tomato growing industry would boost growth in rural areas. Nowhere is this industry more likely to flourish than here in the country's fertile middle belt. But now that factories are no longer buying locally grown produce, farmers are becoming increasingly worried. Benedicta grows tomatoes on a hectare of land. We have to buy water every day when it doesn't rain. A tank of water costs 120 CDs, 20 euros. And that's not even enough for the whole farm. We have to buy water every day for about a month and a half until the rain comes. We have a lot of problems, which makes it hard to survive in this country. Crops grow in abundance here. The farmers could cultivate even more land and employ more workers, but they lack funds. If they want to buy seed and fertilizer and pay for irrigation water, they need to take out loans. We don't have money for fertilizer. Everything's expensive. We can't sell our harvest and end up in debt. I have a wife and children to care for. That's why I'll have to head to the desert and try my luck elsewhere. People who make it to Europe have better lives than we do. Life is hard for us. Every day you see people struggling, and still we have nothing. I'm ready. If the chance comes today or tomorrow, I'll head to the desert. My farm is failing, and the bank wants its money back. Now that the factories are closed, farmers such as Benedicta have to sell their produce to the market queens, who sell it on in the cities. There's a surplus of produce during the harvest season, so the farmers have to sell at rock-bottom prices. I asked for 320 CDs. They offered 270 and said others are giving even less. At this price, I won't earn anything. Two weeks ago, we sold these crates for 550 CDs and the big ones for 700. Now the crates can go for as little as 60 or even 50 CDs, just 10 euros. If the market is bad like today, we farmers have to give our produce away. We sell at whatever price they'll give us. Tomatoes are a food staple in Ghana. They account for 40% of spending on vegetables. Middle-class Ghanaians like their tomatoes canned. Ghana could meet at least a portion of its demand itself, but the canned tomatoes here on the market are not domestic ones. Some are from China, some are from Italy, some are from Spain, some are from the States. 
I would be very happy if we have a company here in Ghana that we produce our own tomatoes. We can them instead of people going to import it and bringing it here, spending a whole lot of money there. When they give that money to the country, it helps the country to develop. Benedicta's husband has gone to Italy, hoping to earn money to help support the family, to pay for the children's school fees, and also so they can invest in a house and a well to irrigate their crops. My husband can earn more there than in Ghana. He sends money every month for me and our two children. Here in the village, it's obvious which families have relatives in Europe. They're the ones whose homes are made of concrete. Despite the problems besetting the industry, many here continue to grow tomatoes. Benedicta's house is still under construction. For now, she's still paying rent. Some prefer canned tomatoes because they're more convenient. You just add water and they're ready. But I prefer fresh ones. Fresh ones, now. They're more important. I have four friends who farm tomatoes, and they're all ready to set out to the desert. My husband is in Europe and is making money, and I'm working here. That's how we manage, and the children can go to school. We also use his money to pay rent and part of it to complete our house. If he were here, it would be very hard for us. I'm always glad to see people leave and try their luck elsewhere. Hello. Ah, Nana, what is it? Italy. He's in Italy. He worked on an apple farm, later on a tomato plantation, and now he herds animals. Most Ghanaian migrants live in other West African countries. Many also live in the US and Canada, and in Europe. For Ghanaian farmers, there's no legal route to Europe. Most pass through the Sahara Desert and then cross the Mediterranean. According to the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, 16,000 Ghanaians took this path to Italy in the last five years. Many African migrants end up in southern Italy. The tomatoes grown here are processed and sold in cans, including at low prices in Ghana. With production heavily subsidized, Italian tomatoes have a competitive advantage over local goods in Africa. The seasonal workers from Africa actually contribute to the problem by working for rock-bottom wages, which further lowers production costs. Few of them have residence permits. 
The day laborers are exploited by mafia organizations recruited by agents known as caporali. These middlemen pay them per crate after they deducted a commission. From morning to evening, you go and collect 20 euro, 30 euro a day. So, we are Africa. How can you say you are a woman? Yeah, I have a part one of the one. I have a part one of the one. I have a part one of the one. I have a part one of the I said, what is the problem? I said, 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 I I do tomatoes for Ghana, and here I still do tomatoes. We are not working like Italy. Ghana, you pick it one one, which you write, and leave the verde. My father is a farmer. My mother is also a farmer. They used to grow tomatoes. The company collapsed. That make me travel to Italy here, so. And now we are living in a ghetto, you see, uh, everything full of bottles, you see our building. We do it by ourselves. Edward and the other seasonal workers live in shanty towns, dilapidated huts or tents in the middle of fields. There's no water, no sanitary facilities, electricity or heating. They don't know where I'm living now. They know I'm in Italy, but they don't know where I'm living. And I'll never tell them, because if I even tell them, they will worry. No matter how you are here, you have to fight to take care of your family. You have mother, you have father, or you have, even sometimes your cousins, all of them, they have problems, they'll call you, and you can't say that you can't help them. So you are here fighting, like we that we are in trouble now. Our life is like, now we will sell our life to help our family. When it's really hot, Edward and Rasta sleep outside rather than in the makeshift plastic tents. Edward's been in Italy for four years. He lives in constant hope that he'll make enough to be able to return home. But once he sent a bit of money to his family in Ghana, he has barely enough to survive. Mm. By force. By force. In Cerignola, the Pietra di Scarto cooperative grows organic tomatoes. It also hires seasonal workers from Africa, but they earn a decent wage and are given proper contracts. They're not day laborers at the mercy of the exploitative caporalato system. Dian Shaikh is from Senegal 
and has worked on many plantations. It was only when I began here that I realized what goes on at the other plantations. I used to think it was just the way things worked in Italy. Now I'm here, I understand what's going on, that we're being exploited. Pietro Fragasso is head of the cooperative. He wants to raise awareness of the plight of the seasonal workers. We need to tell consumers so that you could buy a can of tomato puree for 40 cents. Alex, Abdul, Giuseppe and Antonio were exploited. They were forced to live in terrible conditions with no basic rights, no running water, no electricity. So do you still want to buy those tomatoes? Processed tomato products are sold for next to nothing. Even though picking, processing, packaging and transport all have to be accounted for. Profit is all that matters. That's why a kilo of tomatoes often fetches as little as five cents. If I, as a farmer, am getting paid just five cents per kilo, how am I going to make a living? It's impossible. I need to buy the seedlings, irrigate them. I need fertilizer. I need to rent a tractor. These are fixed costs. The only flexible costs are the wages I pay my workers. We mustn't forget that the Caprolato system is a consequence. It's a consequence of a market that has spiraled completely out of control. Pietro wants to beat the system. His tomatoes are sold through a fair trade organization for 30 instead of 5 cents per kilo. They're also processed in factories with fair conditions. Consumers pay more for the final product, but they know they're making an ethical choice. The speculation economy has resulted in food becoming a commodity that's dumped on markets so that someone else can earn money from speculation with food. The tomato industry isn't the only one in which people are being exploited. It's the same with watermelons and many other agricultural products often high-quality products, too. Bucking the global system isn't easy. It involves restructuring the entire farm-to-consumer chain. Pietro aims to prove that processed tomato products can be made ethically. He wants his cooperative to serve as an example, a small step to changing the entire production system. Hundreds of trucks drive along here every day. They're transporting tons and tons of tomatoes. We need to decide if tomatoes are worth paying for. If not, we're stuck with slavery. Lots of people say we need to help the situation improve in Ghana so that these people don't come here in the first place. But global economics and politics make that impossible. There's no tomato processing industry in Ghana, which goes to show how sick the system is, how utterly crazy. In Europe, industrial farming, subsidies and wage dumping are resulting in surpluses. Cut price European tomatoes end up exported to international markets. Today, Italy is just a minor player in the global tomato industry. China is now the world's biggest producer. It exports tomato paste, often diluted with cheap filler ingredients, all over the world. 60 million tons per year, 10 times more than Italy. The most important metric in global exports is profitability. Any negative impact on the countries that import the goods is irrelevant. Trade policy is not development policy, and Africa is a lucrative destination. For export nations, Africa is a market like any other. China, as a responsible major country, has always been a strong advocate of free trade. 
We look forward to expanding economic and trade cooperation with African countries, Ghana included. We will continue to encourage the Chinese Trade Association and the business to come to Africa to introduce high-end Chinese brands and quality products to the African market and consumer. Free trade is the principle that opens the African market to exports. After independence, African countries introduced customs duties in order to protect domestic farmers and emerging industries. But now these restrictions are being lifted, despite the fact that most African nations still struggle to compete on the international market. Ghana came under international pressure when it tried to increase import tariffs on tomato products to 40%. They're now at 10%, and containers full of cut-priced tomatoes continue to arrive in the country. Economist Kobe Naotu is familiar with the problem, and as an academic, he can speak more freely than the Ghanaian government, which has to take into account international investors. Yeah, yeah, fresh wine. Now, nah, China, the... China, smoking, and not China. Uh-huh. Who's the dear? Can one. <laughs> so this one is from China. How can I get this? Something that you're eating more in the rubber. Only 30% tomato. About 70% starch. The problem with this product is that they more or less take over the domestic market for tomatoes, pushing out um, domestic producers. So you have um, a large number of tomato farmers who could not sell their products. It's from Thailand. It's a Thai rice. You have plenty of land for growing rice. But again, the rice farmers face the same problem as the tomato farmers. So we are consuming rice in large quantities. We are estimated to import rice to the tune of about $500 million annually. Tomato paste and rice are not the only products jeopardizing African markets and threatening the livelihoods of farmers. In 2018, for example, the EU also exported milk powder and concentrate and meat to West Africa. At this market in Accra, it's easy to see how imports are driving out domestic products. Many Ghanaian poultry farmers are also giving up. They can't compete with EU imports. I mean, in the 1990s, Ghana was producing about 90% of its poultry needs. Today, we only produce 5%. Most of the poultry products on our market are actually wastes on the European market. That 95% of poultry product coming from elsewhere translates into job losses here. It translates to destruction of livelihoods. It translates into poverty down here. And it translates into frustration that leads young people to want to get out of this country. We do not have the capacity to change these things because we have lost control of our policy. In Rwanda, about two years ago, banned the import of second-hand clothing from the U.S. And U.S. kicked them out of the African Growth and Opportunities Act. So that is how vicious the response can be if you try to change policy to favor your own people. Free trade should not destroy livelihoods. It does make me sad, sometimes to the point of anger, because those who profit are very few. The losers are many.
Timoti Apanya is an agricultural advisor in northern Ghana, near the tomato factory in Pualugu that's gone out of business. As a result, local farmers are desperate. Many of them leave the region. Others are experimenting with alternative crops. Some still do grow tomatoes, but just for their own families. But all the, the place we are seeing was all done by tomatoes. When the Palgu tomato factory was in session, they used to make a lot of money. Even the, uh, those, they, they, they told me that they were making plenty money because they, the factory needed it and then the market also needed it. But what can you do? We have to survive, so we have to continue to put in much effort as we can. The soil is good. And the tomatoes suited very well. Now it came to the market, no market. So everything got perished in the field. They will have no, uh, people are not coming to buy. And it led to suicide. They have to take their lives. Because if they don't take their lives, the bank will come after them. They don't have the money to pay. Many people have left to try their luck elsewhere. Most of them go to the cities. Salifu went first to Kumasi, then to Accra. Now he's planning to make the journey to Europe. Neither of my children go to school. I'm not happy about that. I know they should go to school, but I can't afford the fees. Sometimes we don't even have money to eat at night. We've seen the images of dead migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. My wife is praying for my safe voyage. She knows I'm going to give our children a better future. I will pray to God along the voyage. God wants us to pray and to trust in him whatever happens. This house is being built by my brother who lives in Accra, and this one by my brother in Kumasi. This is my house. When I return, I would like to tear it down and build a concrete one, and also one for my mother. People like Salifu can't just apply for a visa, board a plane and fly to Europe. Their only option is to save as much money as they can and try to make their own way there. Anyone who can afford it enlists the help of someone known in the village as a travel agent. Salifu is getting some advice before he leaves. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, We have no choice. Our situation here forces us to take this risk. Even if I die, my children can be proud of me. Because I won't have died stealing or robbing someone, but because I wanted to give them a better future. But it simply wasn't God's will. It's hard to tell if someone's on their way to the market or on their way to Europe. Some who decide to make the journey don't tell their families until they've already left. Many young men in the region are tired of waiting for life to improve. They get to a point where leaving feels like their only option. The men who hope to work on one of Italy's tomato plantations have only one way to reach Europe, across the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean. It's a journey that will cost some of them their lives. Caritas Relief Organization has built a chapel near the tomato fields in Apulia. There are showers here, and the workers can also seek advice and free medical treatment. Edward survived the journey from Africa, but he had an accident in the van on the way to the tomato fields. Under normal circumstances, this would be covered by workers' compensation, and Edward would be paid sick leave. But on Apulia's tomato plantations, Edward is only paid for the crates he fills so he needs to get back on his feet as quickly as possible. But Dr. Giovanni Magnifico can only help so much. He can't go back to work because he'd be exposing the wound to dust and soil and he'd be risking an infection. He also has a headache. He suffered a head trauma. If they don't work, they don't earn anything. We should be providing them with support. They need to be given food, something to eat. And when they go back to work, 
They're back at square one. They have nothing and no one who can help them. Migrants contribute a substantial share of financial aid to Ghana. Edward sends remittances home every month, even though he earns so little. He works as hard as he can, and it's still never enough. He lives not only with the weight of his family's expectations, but also with the hostility of many locals. Many Italians think we're useless. They're afraid of us because we're black. They still need workers, and we are not having documents to work for them. It's very bad. Only they know what they are doing. My junior brother, so he's waiting for the money to support him, to pay school fees and books. And as you can see, anything a student need. Yeah, I carry something because I have the responsibility to take care of my family. No, without money, they can't do nothing. Yeah. So far as me, never get it. Then I have to support them and get better future for them. Hello. Hello, Kelly. Yeah, bla. Good afternoon. Afternoon, how are you? Ah, uh, me no kasa we are just all day. I'm not phone. Any problem? There's something happen. You say. Me say nya kaz den ten ten. Me free kula na so moti me kaa. Me bo mama ni amobe wore do do. Ena me say adia me ni me ni na me hoto me. Eh, na mama mama ti me kaa. Me say do. Hmm. Ndi ya juma na yako na kaa ni ya den. Ena az den to kwa nzo. Hmm. By the way, anti mo. Oso. Oh, my prayer, but I say, say, meet me, cash out, yeah, baby, yeah, 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 I dream to go back and do something for myself. Nice now. I'm growing. My friends. I'm at work. Before when they will come, we don't prepare something for them. Yeah, they are coming back from work. Yeah, it's late. Yeah, it's now 7.30 now. Yeah. in Africa, you get it from maize. Yeah, because maize is not many, you use semola. Yeah, Italian banku. If I'm on my doing this banku, I just remember home because my mother used to do it the same.
Hey, you can't go back to home. You can't go back to Africa like this. Oh, why you? We left Africa we are responsibility. So how can we go to Africa just like this? No, that's the reason why we can't we can't go back. How many years I spent in this country? And I go back to my country with zero. So me, I know that one day, one day, one day, this God will answer my prayers and I'll achieve my destiny. Stand up, please. Stand up, please. Near the town of Techiman, one man has made it his mission to revitalize the local tomato industry. When he returned home to Ghana some years ago, Will Apalo Ofori was shocked by what he saw defunct factories, desperate farmers, and tons of imported tomatoes. After studying and working in the US, he wants to invest in his own country. Ghanaian tomatoes could be a gold mine, red gold, but he's also aware of his social responsibility. Our mandate is to make sure that farmers have enough money in their pockets because they have not been benefiting from the farming environment for quite some time. It's going to change the, the landscape because once we start pro producing on a very, very large scale, in five, ten years, we want to see the whole landscape changing into producing quality tomatoes. I hope it's not tomatoes. I wish I have all my tomatoes packed in this and going out. That's the vision. Because if we have container full of Tepco tomatoes going towards the harbor for shipment, that will make me really feel good. And uh, knowing that I have fulfilled my assignment on Earth. Many attempts have been made to revive the Ghanaian tomato industry. A factory was opened here in Techiman in 2007, but it's been closed for years. Perhaps it's about to get a second chance. Buy Ghana, eat Ghana, dress Ghana, provide everything that you can because this is who, who we are. Our capacity is about two metric tons per hour. We are comfortable that this company will go a long way to be sustained, providing jobs as well as money in the pockets of all farmers and every stakeholder involved here. Once the youth have the guarantee of work, then they will not have to be migrating through the desert and to the Mediterranean where they will be dying. If the government wants to make sure that the industry survives here in Ghana, there has to be a way of protecting the industries. Buffers like reducing the imports from outside into the country, but if the government does not provide that comfort zone, then the competition will be unbearable for us, unfortunately. 
If the tomato factory were given a fair chance, it might help boost the region's fortunes. Trade policies could support development in struggling countries rather than hinder it. Then Benedicta's family might be able to earn a living from tomato farming. Her husband could remain at home. And if he did decide to work in Europe for a while, he might be able to travel there safely and live and work in fair conditions. Good morning. I'm here to go now, sir. And I have a few. Every morning we talk, and every evening we talk. On certain days, you see young men with backpacks walking in groups of ten. You know that they're going to the desert. Someone left a week ago, but I haven't heard if he's arrived or not. As far as the danger goes, we humans can die or we can live. This journey is just like our life. You might win or you might lose. That's why they make this journey. 